This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. Hello, it is the Blood Red Podcast with myself, Sean Bradbury, and a crack team today, the dynamic duo of Connor Dunn and Theo Squires. Gents, how are we doing? Connor, you've been writing about the Reds for us today. Busy day? Yeah, actually quite a lot around. Obviously, they're off to America, aren't they? And there's all sorts coming and press conferences this afternoon and open train will be there. So there's just plenty to write about, plenty around and lots to go at. So lots of exciting stuff to talk about in the podcast today. Indeed. And, and Theo, we've dragged you away from the blog for half an hour. How's it all going? Any any good rumours today? Not really. It's been quite quiet today. I think it's just been a week of uh, Nabil for Gerbis and for Luke Coutinho that. It's quite nice to be away from it all. <laughs> Wind it down a little bit. Well, this is it. Well, what we're going to discuss today then is um, pre-season really and Liverpool's trip to the US uh, which they've flown out on first match tomorrow made light work at Tramway and Bradford but it kind of steps up a bit now with Dortmund, Seville, Lisbon to follow and the first match against Dortmund in South Bend, Indiana at 1am our time in the early hours of Saturday uh, how we're going to do this is Connor's written a piece which you'll be able to read online um, which basically kind of guides readers through the, the key questions that we feel about that Klopp has to answer, Klopp and Liverpool have to answer on this US tour, so we thought we'd base the pod around them, flesh them out a little bit, and also include a few questions people have sent our way on social media. Uh, so there's, yeah, there's six six questions Connor's taken a look at in his piece, the first of which is, who provides cover to the front three? And obviously the, the picture's changed a little bit for the Reds here, Sturridge is gone, Ings is gone, you've got Shaqiri currently injured. Um, so yeah, we'll start on this one, chaps. What have you made of the performance of the forward options in pre-season so far? I mean, Connor, there's been no shortage of players who've, who've stepped up and scored. No, certainly not. Obviously, Bruce has got three goals in two games, which is really decent. But um, I think you've got to look at like he's playing Tranmere and he's playing Bradford City, and no disrespect to those two teams, but Dortmund, Seville, and Sporting Lisbon are going to be massively different tests for him, and it'll be really good to see how he gets on. I mean, the question about who could come in as cover for those front three, they're obviously, you know, they're the world-class front three. They're the first choice front three. They are incredible. But Liverpool are going to play a lot of football this season and they will need a little bit of a break lead in the line. Um, it's been a question that's dominated the summer, really, hasn't it? And if they're going to bring anyone in or who they're going to get. Obviously, Origi's just signed a new contract, which gives you a good in, like, indication of how Klopp's feeling about him. And yeah. probably he's going to be one of the ones that, you know, is a senior option that can come in and provide cover as he's shown how well he can do. Um, Brewster is obviously one that everybody's super excited about, but Klopp today has obviously tempered expectations a little bit and sort of said, you know, don't put too much pressure on him. He's only young, but he looks a real talent. And you know, you don't score goals in preseason like that if you if you can't play football. So it'll be exciting, and I think you know, if Klopp can get out of those two players what he's got out of or Rigi so far and keep getting out what he got out of Brewster, it'd be really exciting. So where where do you stand on this one? Are they the two? If if it was to be those two going into the start of the season, Brewster and Origi, um, would you see that as sufficient backup for the Reds? Um, yeah, I do. Because um, if you're looking at direct strikers, um, it's not a case of they need a number two striker. Because realistically, Liverpool will be like, oh, Firmino's not available. They will be playing Salah there or they'll be playing Mane there. Yeah. And Origi is just that added option across the whole front through, uh, three. I think Klopp's already said that Brewster is a good striker. He's got that talent, but he wants him to be able to play in those wide positions as well. Um, Shakiri might be back for the start of the season so he's another option cutting and they've always got this different set of abilities and I think um, we need to throw Oxley chamberlain here in this front three because he made such an impact in midfield when he first got into the Liverpool team when he really made the position his own but to think to go from that straight back in after a long time out into midfield that's a lot to ask for a player going mm. box to box so it's probably going to be a bit kinder on his legs if he's used more in the, that out wide position for the next six months or so as he begins to feel his way back into Premier League football. But as Connor said, it's all about that front three, isn't it? Um, they don't miss a lot of football. They get the job done. Uh, they've been playing football consistently for how many years now with international tournaments every summer and they still go away and do the business. We've seen Firmino score at the Copper America, win the Copper America. Mano's in the Cup of Nations final scoring goals, one of the leading goal scorers in the tournament. Uh, Salah was scoring goals as well before uh, Egypt got knocked out. They're all very good players. And while Liverpool are never going to have someone of that quality in reserve, just because you're not going to get someone happy enough to be in reserve, mm. Brewster, Origi, Oxley chamberlain they're all very good players in their own right. It's a big opportunity, isn't it, for those players? You know, massive opportunity for Brewster on this US tour to really prove against some of Europe's top teams what he's got and what he can do. And, you know, to be Klopp's first choice option, you know, I think for Origi, obviously he's a cult hero, he's shown everybody what he can do, and it's been wonderful scenes last season. But, you know, if Bruce is going to give him a challenge for that place, it's only going to make those two improve. And I just think quite a lot rests on the US tour for those players, and, you know, really stating their case as the best backup option in Liverpool's 
squad. Mm -hmm. It's funny with Brewster as well. I think all this hype and expectation, and he still he's not faced a proper opposition. He's not yeah. had that competitive, yeah. um, competitive action. But oh, we've done a piece on it before. Um, he's part of that really special England under 17s World Cup winning side. And you look at the players in that group who he was lauded alongside. It was uh, Jaden Sancho, Phil Foden, and Callum Hudson Odoi. Well, Hudson Odoi wasn't in the Chelsea team a year ago. If it wasn't for injury, he'd have been first choice for half a season last year. He's a full England international. Uh, Sancho, I think most of the teams in the Premier League would happily take him off Dortmund now. He was outstanding last year in the Bundesliga. And Foden, he's probably at the worst club for him to be at in the chance of uh, <laughs> first team opportunities. But Guardiola worships him. Um, it's not going to be long before he's making that position his own, especially with uh, David Silva, time of city coming to an end. Mm. Well, following on from this, then we put a shout out on social media to our, our Facebook followers and, and on Twitter as well. Any questions? And the one that came in that relates to this was from Brad Fairclough on our Blood Red Facebook page. Um, so he, he boiled it down to one question. I'll put this to you guys. Start with you, Connor. Uh, in the first game of the season, if Mane's still out, which let, let's say it's the Community Shield, um, looks like he, he probably will be. Would you start Origi or Brewster in that game? I think a couple of internal factors are going to come into it in terms of form and how people are playing, how they're feeling in themselves, if they've got any niggles or they feel they want to be a bit fresher for the start of pre-season. But I think right now your your natural option is to put Dibok Origi on that, on that left-hand side, have him cutting in. He's pretty direct, he's pretty attacking. It'll cause City's defence on some undoubted problems. Um, in a similar mould to probably what Manny would do, maybe, maybe not so many crosses, but maybe a bit more direct into the box, which would be good to see. However, like as I just said, you know, if if Brewster comes through this preseason, he's banging goals against Dortmund and you know, he's firing against Sporting Lisbon, he's got to be in with a massive, massive mm. shout. Um and then you could see, you know, a, a different formation which I'm sure we'll come on to later. <laughs> um, Theo, how about yourself on this one? You just mentioned the idea of seeing Brewster more in those wide positions. So, you know, looking at Brad's question here, we're we're assuming, I suppose, that Firmino's playing, Salah's playing, and as Connor's just said, it's it's that left wing slot really, isn't it? Origi or Brewster for you? Um, if it's just the one slot, I have to go Origi. He's the one who's proven. He's done it time and time again. But I look at the Community Shield and it's it's a glorified friendly. It's not the Norwich Premier League opener. So I'd throw Brewster in that. I'd um, probably give Firmino a rest. Yeah. Um, I think he's had, had his injury at the end of last season. He's gone and had the international tournament. He's still feeling his way back. So it's a, lot, uh, a big ask to have him go straight into it at Wembley in what is going to be a competitive friendly in a weird sort of way. I'd much rather have him fresh for the Norwich game. So I think it's going to be a big last test for Brewster. Go and play against the best team in the country, show us what you can do, and then take him out of the limelight a little bit with Firmino coming in to start against Norwich. Mm, interesting. Um, moving on to the second question then. What is the best midfield heading into the new season? So I guess we're looking at that that three in the middle for now. And in your piece, Connor, you know, a little, a little preview of it here, but you know, you, you discuss that there's a pool of around, well, almost a dozen players, if you include all the guys who are out there in pre-season and the, the ones who Klopp has available to him. Now, we know Klopp will go horses for courses. There'll, there'll of course, be rotation across the season, especially with, with the demands of all the competitions the Reds are in. But as it stands then, who, who would you look upon as your first choice front three? Let's just say, you know, in a big game, everyone's fit. Who, who are you looking at? Connor, we'll start with you. Yeah, he's just got such a massive amount of players in those positions. When you're looking at, you know, if you're including the likes of Trent Woodburn, Wilson, Curtis Jones, they've all, you know, around and about in pre season, and that probably gives Klopp 12 options in the midfield. I think right now you've got to look at your strongest midfield for Liverpool, given how attacking they set up. You want a bit of defensive work race. It's got to be, for me, Fabinho, Henderson, and Wijnaldum. I think the different options that they all give you, their ability to fill in at different positions if they're needed, Henson going further up the pitch, Fabinho looking forward, the defensive work rate, they're running, it's just, it's a really well balanced midfield, but again, I think this pre-season, this US tour gives Klopp such a massive opportunity to tinker with that midfield, to see which, who works best where, if they can slightly unbalance with, you know, the likes of Oxley chamberlain in there, like pushing forward a bit more and mm. how two fits in with one playing slightly further forward. But I think there's a lot of option, but those three would be, you know, your tried and trusted, I would say, or the going forward tried and trusted. Mm. I think personally, I think Connor's nailed it there, Theo. And I, well, I also think we'll see Milner at the start of the season, given that he's, you know, has had the summer off and looks like he's, you know, as fit as he's ever been. But I think that that is the three, the ones that Connor's mentioned. But where would where would you stand? Would you throw Ox in? Would you throw Cater in? Or is it is it that three for you as well? Uh, I think it's got to be that three just because those are the ones who have proven it time and time again. Looking back at last season as a whole, they were probably your three best mid 
um, three midfielders. Um, then you're looking at the other options. Well, it's what you want to see from Cater, what you want to see from Oxley mm. Chamberlain. They've shown in the past that they've got the talent, but for whatever reason, with injuries or settling in in a new country, they haven't had that run in the past year, 18 months. So if they can get to the highest of their abilities and be the players that the fans want to see, then you're probably giving them a good shout to throw in, maybe take Van Alden's spot. But I think uh, Henderson's position at the club has changed so much, especially in the eye of the fans in the last six months. Yeah. He's gone from being that uh, ridiculed figure uh, in the number six position to being, well, he's got to be one of the first names on the team sheet now. He's the captain of the European champions. He made such an impact on that for us in all uh, two months of the season. Fabinho, what a player, what difference he made last season. Liverpool having that actual defensive midfielder rather than someone who's just been moulded into it because to, as a sacrifice for the rest of the players. And Vinaldum, we've gone from thinking, oh, he's just a squad player. Uh, he might even move on to being probably Klopp's most consistent performer. Hmm. It's such a nice problem to have, isn't it? Oh, There's just definitely. so many players of such incredible talent in that midfield and so many different options and so many different talents and abilities all in the same role. And I think every single one of them on this tour is going to face such a challenge to stake their claim in the face of some amazing players in their own ranks. Mm, absolutely well following on from that and the, the, the wealth of options and whether there could be a bit of outside the box thinking from Klopp we had a question from Michael Simons on Twitter um, start with you Connor on this one could we see Oxlade Chamberlain playing games on the wing given the amount of midfield as the Reds have and not necessarily as much cover for the front three yeah certainly I mean that that will come into different formation options won't it but he, he certainly has the talent and, and the pace and the ability to play out on the wings it's just how again it's going to be massively horses for courses it's massively going to be which options Klopp thinks is going to be best suited for any opposition but it, without a shadow of a doubt he is, he is an option there isn't he mm. what do you think Theo because it, it did look at times when, when Ox was out that his, his kind of burst in runs his pace his, his shots through the middle of the pitch was what Liverpool were, were missing but given we've all just essentially picked their first choice midfield three and he wasn't quite in it do you think we could be seeing him out on the wing and having a go there yeah, definitely. Um, what he's always shown throughout his career is his versatility. Um, he can play in either flank, he can play in the middle. And while Liverpool have seen the best of him in the middle, like I said earlier, it's a big ask to throw him straight back in there, yeah. um, leading the press. Uh, what Liverpool lacked last year was probably that player as an alternative to Mane. Um, so Mane was exclusively on the left or up front, whereas you had Shakiri maybe coming in instead of Salah when you wanted to rest him or bring him off. Uh, so that's what Oxley chamberlain gives you, doesn't it? He's that probably the closest Liverpool have got to that right footer with pace who can go on the out wide and cut in but even then Liverpool have in the past done like the 4-4-2 had him on his favoured side on the right that's something else he offers so that's another formation that could come into contention this year and then when you've got Shakiri as well that's another option but he, that's why he was signed isn't it it's for that versatility for that talent that he can offer so much in so many different positions uh, it's going to be one of the most exciting things I think to keep an eye on this season how good can he become? Because whenever he's about to hit top performance, something's horrible has happened for him injury-wise. Mm. And it's cost him on the international front as well. Whenever he's like been cementing his place in the England setup, he's got injured at the wrong time. And they've always been quite bad injuries. Yeah, it's not, as say, it's not like niggly injuries, no. is it? It's not like he's an injury-prone player. They're like serious injuries that cause him all manner of problems. It's not like he's one of those players... You know, probably like your Dejan Lovren to like get bits of injuries here and there. He, he has had serious proper injuries that mm. have knocked him out for a little while. So you've got to hope if he can stay injury free, which you expect him to, and the future's looking really exciting. Mm. My only concern for him is um, you think those sorts of players, when it is all about that sudden movement, that pace, when you've got a serious injury like that, it's quite a lot to overcome mentally. Mm. Like I think we all remember a couple of seasons ago, Daniel Sturridge against uh, Bayern Munich in pre season when he's sprinted against Bayern scored the goal but he's pulled up immediately uh, I don't think we saw him sprint again for two years mm. <laughs> it's a big ask on the body to be able to go straight back into it and does he still have the pace can he still lead the press in that same way um, but then we've seen players before who've come back from that sort of injury and has still have the ability like Joe Gomez he doesn't look any slower than he did two years ago we've got to remember it took him what, a good six months to get up to speed again mm. uh, Oxley chamberlain is going to have to be used to being a squad player for the next six months just so he can get used to it again despite all that um, momentum and ability he showed when he was sort of high on life just being back in the team mm -hmm. well you mentioned Joe Gomez there Theo and the next question Concerns the defence. What about the defence is the question in Connor's piece. Well, I think this really boils down to one thing and a question we had from Tommy Corley, again on our Facebook group, 
Um, I think this 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 is the key question here, really. Who starts the season alongside Van Dijk? Um, so, go on, Theo. We'll start with you on this. Is is it Gomez, the man you just mentioned? It has to be Gomez for me. I know uh, Joel Matip did so well towards the end of last season, but Liverpool looked that much better with Joe Gomez in the heart of defence during the first half of the season, and he is Liverpool's future. Like we say, um, Van Dijk's that talisman. Um, he's at the peak of his powers. But Joe Gomez is someone who, if he gets it right and can avoid injuries, he's going to be a member of this Liverpool defence for the next 10-15 years. He is that good a player. Um, how many other players can you see at that age with that cemented in heart of defence? Players at that age don't tend to do it. There's only the real world-class quality players. And we've seen one of them today join Juventus for nearly £70 million. Liverpool have got a proper baller on their hands here. Mm. Um, he's just got to. There was such good chemistry with Van Dijk. And with Matip and with Lovren, there's always that question mark over they might do something a bit stupid. They might be a bit of a calamity. Whereas Gomez, I can't remember him making any mistakes. No. He looks, looks so assured. And he's probably the player that complements Van Dijk the best. He's not that aerial dominance, but he can still pass the ball well. He's got that pace to cover. And I think that is such an important part of Liverpool's defence when you've got such attacking fullbacks that you need the pace in the middle. So whilst uh, we have to show loyalty to Matip towards the end of last season, it's a new season now. You've got pre-season to look at all your options and if they're all fit and there's not much to choose behind them, go for the long-term option. Mm. Simple as that as well, Connor. It's Gomez and Van Dijk. Yeah, it's going to sound a bit like the Gomez fan club here and I know there's a few <laughs> people in the office that actually would choose Matip but he just happens mm. to have the two people on the pod. I'm a <laughs> massive fan of Gomez. I think if you remember back to when the start of Liverpool last season, they conceded an absolutely ridiculously low number of goals yeah. with Gomez and Van Dijk in the heart of defence. And it's so harsh on Matic because of the way he stepped up when Liverpool so desperately needed him. Liverpool had nothing else when he came in. He came in as essentially what fourth choice defender, stepped up incredibly well. Liverpool won the Champions League with him. So it's so it's so harsh. But I think that is why this tour against sides like Dortmund, against sides like Sporting, that they're really top level European sides, gonna be so important for the likes of Gomez and the likes of Matic because Klopp is gonna have to take and make a big decision about one of them from that and it will it will mean a lot to it. like you know Klopp's shown so many times in the past that he he thinks a lot about training he puts a lot of onus on how people train how people play in these friendly games and that is what he looks at for people's form going forward mm. and, and if Matip has a scream a few 45 minutes against the likes of Dortmund and stuff there's he's gonna be in with a massive shout of starting Lovren is obviously gonna have to work incredibly hard and essentially perform a miracle to get in as Liverpool's first choice next to Van Dijk because He's just fallen down the pecking order, and he's probably the the only loser out of last season, really, isn't he? Just in mm. terms of not being able to play when, you know, the other boys stepped up. But you know, AC Milan are interested in him, and it remains to be seen whether or not a deal will be done. But yeah, I think other parts of the defence you've got to look at. Obviously, you've got Vandenberg who came in. There'll be a lot of interest in seeing him play. Mm. It's unlikely that he'll be you know challenging for a first team slot straight away. But there's all sorts of people looking at his development with eager anticipation um, you've got Nat Phillips as well he's also round and about and we're obviously going to come on to who might be loaned out in in a minute but he'll be one of those ones they're looking at that can he perform at that top level or mm. perhaps is he his, his development best served elsewhere playing some really stellar championship football and then you've got Nathaniel Klein as well obviously course, yeah. he scored against Tranmere and well, he scored the first goal, didn't he? And yeah. said, I'm, I'm still here, everybody. But he, his, his future is an interesting one. And I think he's another one where pre-season, you know, it's going to matter a little bit. He can either put himself in the shop window and Liverpool can strike or that transfer iron is maybe hot with him. Or perhaps, you know, he's like, here, I've got, I've got, I've got that pace and I can cover Trent Alexander-Arnold if you need me to. And if he's happy to do that, then by all means. But yeah, I think, I think it's, a, it's a big few games coming up for some of these players. I mm-hmm. think with Klein as well, it has a lot to do with Gomez. So if Joe Gomez has a good pre-season and you're saying, right, you're Van Dijk's first choice defensive partner, then you probably keep Klein around because he can be then the first choice yeah. back up yeah, to Trent. Exactly. Um, but then if Matip's your first choice centre-back, then Gomez is probably, you, you fill in on both sides of the defence um, at fullback just to get him a bit more game time. And then you've obviously got James Milner who can fill on both sides. Uh, that's the one thing that you can count against Klein most. He isn't versatile. He's like one of the few players in the full squad who can only just play one position. Yeah. Personally, I'd move him on. I think he's got a year left on his contract. Uh, he's not going to be there for a future for Liverpool. It is just going to be a stopgap like Daniel Sturridge last year. Uh, we've seen um, Tottenham since losing the Champions League final. They've decided to uh, sort of start again, a new generation move players on Kieran Trippier has moved on they want to sell Danny Rose mm. and you think you raise your eyebrows at like that thinking these are experienced players who have done a good job for however many years 
but then you can understand at the same time why they're turning to youth and when no one's got any doubts about the talent in Liverpool's youth because they've already replaced these players why keep them around as an expensive reserve when you've got the likes of Hover coming through it doesn't make sense to me no well, kind of you uh, hinted at it there. The next question is concerning the future of players and you know how how that will kind of shake up on tour over the next nine or ten days. So, who could go on loan? Who could be sold? And where are the gaps that do still need to be filled? Um, so, well, well, let, let's start with players who could be sold. I mean, we've we've done done Klein, mentioned him, uh, touched on Lovren. Who else is there? Really, kind of is it, is it essentially those two potentially Mignolet as well? Uh, the noise is coming out of Liverpool recently and from Mignolet himself I don't think he's going anywhere this season anymore I don't think Klopp wants him to go I don't think he actually wants to go and you know I think Liverpool have been so impressed by his professionalism his attitude his ability is obviously undoubted as well and you are definitely not going to find a better number two to come in so it's a lovely situation that Liverpool have with him in the squad and as Klopp said the other day at a big club like Liverpool you need two number ones and fortunately for Liverpool that they have that so that, that's great I don't see Mignolet going anywhere I think there's a question over Ben Woodburn I think yeah. there's a question over Harry Wilson. Um, is it do they go on loan? Do they sell them? You know, Liverpool will be looking for sort of twenty million pounds for for Ben Woodburn, which for, sorry for Harry Wilson even, and that, so that's an exclusive there. Uh... Yeah, the no for, <laughs> for Harry Wilson, and that's <laughs> that's you know that's a decent amount of money for mm. a player. He's obviously pr- proven himself. He's played really well in the Championship last year, and you know, again, this is why we say the tour and pre season and how Klopp and how staff around Melwood are seeing him because. If he can prove himself, it'd be a good option. Don't need to delve into transfer market. Similarly with Ryan Kent, he might go on loan again. There's a few of those midfield players who you think may just be sent on loan to continue the development, may just be sold if some big offers come in You know, for the likes, likes of Wilson. Mm. Is that how you see it as well, Theo, that there's a few who are skirting the line of they could be sold, they could be loaned? And, and also some of you think, well, if the club are just thinking, not about being greedy, but if they think, well, we'll keep Mignolet because he'd be a great backup, we'll keep Lovren even if he's fourth choice, he, you know, he'll do a job for us there. And not kind of best friends with Salah. So. Well, exactly. This, this this does help. This does help. Um, seems to be a lot of fine margins this summer. Yeah, it's the fact that they're not looking to strengthen the, the starting eleven. The starting eleven, you're not going to get much better on it. So if you're looking at um, players elsewhere who are going to come in and know they're going to be reserve players, that's a big test to then gamble, I suppose, on a player who you don't know how they're going to fit into the squad. Whereas there's so much camaraderie there, the players all get on. Like we're talking, Mingle and Origi, obviously both Belgian, they really get on. Salah mm. and Lovren. Uh, the reason Liverpool won the Champions League last year beating Barcelona 4-0 and the 3-0 down is because of that camaraderie there's so much faith in the team um, so that's probably why they don't want to rock the boat and move some of these players on um, and I think quite a lot of the talk about Mingle for example is how good he is as a professional um, but remember at the start of last season when he was told off for mouthing off a bit well it's funny that all the talk about him wanting out is coming from the agent so whether he's playing the game there or if he's actually quite happy as you look at him, a goalkeeper he's what 31 I can understand why he'd want to move on and it's just unfortunate for him the time he's out of the team mm. is probably when the Belgian uh, national team's first choice goalkeeper is also it's most vulnerable he, he could have potentially had that shirt wrapped up um, but then you're looking at other players who could come under threat in a normal summer when Liverpool aren't so happy with the squad it's the likes of Adam Alana, even Shakiri, these players who aren't in the starting eleven. but then maybe it's the similar situation to what Manchester City were in last year they had players who weren't in the starting eleven, who were part of the squad for a year, mm. and it's only a year, eighteen months on, when they've not broken in that they're making those more noises. But at the moment, Liverpool are fine. So those middle ground players, they can retain. It's probably the younger players who you want to see get more first team football that you can move on. Like we've seen Marco Gruwich go out um, with a long term view to coming back. Uh, Adam Lewis, I'd like to see him go out on loan. Mm. He's shown glimpses in pre season, but he's still quite young. And like we've said, Liverpool have got Milner, Gomez. Um, you can cover that left back slot so let him go out on championship or league one for a year and see what you can do uh, Nat Phillips um, I'm a big fan of Nat Phillips and that's because I'm biased because obviously I've seen him grow up at Bolton <laughs> Wanderers I know his dad um, but he was highly rated at Bolton the only reason he didn't get contract there was because the, the financial difficulties at the time I remember watching one under 21's game and uh, Steve Walford who was basically in Martin O'Neill's assistant manager the whole way through his career he was uh, Neil Lennon's assistant at the time he was just come and he used to be a centre half himself I think and he would just wax lyrical lyrical about him every mm. single game saying how good a player he was he was a proper centre back and you think when well, he's what 21, 22 now and he's not got any senior action under his belt so while he could potentially get a Liverpool debut if he hangs around it'd be much better for him to go out in the championship 
because realistically, Dejan Lovren is not a long-term prospect at Liverpool, so there is going to be a slot there for someone to come and stake a claim. And then you're looking at the other players like Wilson, Kent. I don't think Wilson's done enough in pre-season to hang around. He probably needs to go. Uh, Ryan Kent, obviously, he was great against Bradford. He yeah. probably has a chance. Ben Woodburn, I don't think they're going to give up on him just yet because he's that bit younger. But he's another who needs game time. He needs to go out on loan, do it in the championship, and then come back. Mm. Final part of this question then is gaps in the squad. We heard the clock this morning, or maybe it was quotes from last night actually, but he was hinting at one position that he could still be looking to fill. Connor, is that is that as simple as saying that's left back, or could that be potentially referring to a forward position? Yeah, I think you've got to look at, at left back, haven't you? He, he really likes Bruce, they've just offered a Rigi a new contract. I think they're relatively well stuck ahead <coughs> of the field. It's just that senior left back option, which kind of brings you on to the sixth point, which is about the youth players, to be fair. And, mm. you know, You've got Yasser Larucci and you've got Adam Lewis, who Theo's just mentioned, as two players who play in left back. Now, I know Larucci really impressed against Tranmere, and I saw him myself in the FA Youth Cup final. And they Liverpool beat Man City on penalties, but Man City youth side were a very, very good team that night. But Larucci was probably as good as any player on that pitch, and I thought, you know, he's a real, real standout. Um, you know. Liverpool, he, he might, you know, over the course of these next few weeks, of course he needs a couple of games in the US and things like that, give Klopp a reason not to delve into the transfer market for a senior left back. If they think, you know, he can come in for a few games here and there to give Robertson a bit of respite, then then brilliant. I think Lewis is probably more one you're looking at to go on loan, um, just, you know, to see what experience you can get. You know, I can't really say Lurich is going to make it, that would be crazy, but, you know, he's just, he has just impressed when I've seen him and, and before, so... Yeah, and then obviously other youth players. And that's specifically the only gap I think Klopp would be looking at. And then the other youth players you've got that have gone to the tour are Bobby Duncan, Keanu Huevo, Hoover, um, and then two goalkeepers in Jakob. I can't even pronounce his <laughs> second name. I'm so sorry. Uh, a Polish young goalkeeper and then um, Atherton as well. Now, with Hoover and with Duncan, I don't see them challenging for first-team positions immediately. But in similar vein, I think they are going to be ones that the Hanfield hierarchy is going to be looking at with such keen interest and seeing how they play and how they develop and how they are around the first team and in that squad. And obviously, don't forget, Paul Glatzel probably would have been there with Duncan as well yeah. and got an unfortunate injury. But yeah, and then, then the two goalkeepers who were just mentioned, it's going to be great golden opportunity for experience for them, but they're not going to be anywhere near pushing for it. For, I think it's only because, you know, Liverpool have had a few injuries to goalkeepers. Allison's not back and... Um, obviously, Gravara has gone on to Huddersfield, so mm. yeah, it's an interesting time for the youth. No, I disagree with you. I don't think it's a left back. I think it's no. a winger. Yeah, I think it's that versatile forward because at left back, um, we've said pretty much every summer, Liverpool need another left back. Even before Robertson came in, it was when Alberto Moreno looked so dodgy. The fact we had James Milner as a left back for a season, Klopp's very happy to have Milner as that option. He's happy to have Joe Gomez as that option, um, and he likes his versatile players. Realistically, you're not getting someone as a left back who can fill in all across the back four. Maybe you could get someone who can play all along the left wing, but I just think the way Liverpool's front three are, with them all able to play every single position, that you want someone who can play across that front three, who can play in the hole behind the front three. It's going to be a winger. Like You look at the names they've been linked with, that, that's a game changer. Liverpool's defence is already so good, and you can say that, say Robertson gets injured, he's out for a month, I don't think anyone would have any qualms with Milner filling in for a month. Whereas if Liverpool go into the season and they lose Mane for a month, you want someone who's got a bit more about them to either come off the bench if someone else steps up or to you can go straight into that starting eleven. Yeah, mm. I, I understand that. But then in the same, on the other side of the coin, I think you know, you've got Origi who has proved himself playing in that attacking position. You've got, you know, we sent £52 million on Cater who's coming in and he, you know, he, he's coming in showing those flourishes and having a real projection of looking like he's going to be really decent before he got injured at the end of last season. They really went to Bayern Munich in the first half against Barcelona and things like that. So I just think they have these attacking-minded players and those those links with the midfield and, and the front three that maybe suggests to me that it's going to be a defender, but it'll be interesting to see what Liverpool will do. <laughs> Only but, a month or so for us to find out. Yeah. <laughs> well, one I've, I've banged the drum about on a few pods is I think that does look like he might go to Spurs, but Ryan Sessegnon could be someone who, for me, could fill the two gaps, maybe question marks over him defensively, but I think he'd be quite an exciting one. But... Uh, but yeah, interested. So we 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 shall see. Um, I'm sure transfer activity will will reveal which position Klopp really was hinting at there. Um, so last question in our in our kind of sweep of what Liverpool need to 
learn and decide over pre-season is formation. And um, we have like briefly touched upon this, but obviously last season and throughout Klopp's reign so far, four three three has been the staple. But we did have that spell, uh, particularly early on, and kind of as Fabinho was finding his feet of of going four two three one. Um, and I think one of you guys mentioned earlier four four two a possible diamond is is something that that was even more briefly seen, but could be seen again. Um, start with you on this one, Connor. How, do you think it is? as simple as 4-3-3 will still be the main one and we'll see a bit of tweaking or do you think there could be a bit more change this season? I think the one thing about all great managers and I think one thing about Klopp is they never really stand and admire the success. They never really stand and think, oh, I've got a really great side here. They like to improve. They like to move things forward. They like to change things up. And there are definitely a few options that I think we, we may well see. The 4 3 3 is obviously Liverpool's classic. It's probably Liverpool's best formation. You know, it, that midfield three we mentioned, the front three, quality back four, it, you know, it's a hard, it's a hard beaten team. It's a mm. hard beaten formation. But there certainly, certainly is options there, you know, with Oxley Chamberlain, with Cater, with people coming in who you, you may, you know, with that diamond formation where you, you know, you've got Salah at the top, Firmino playing just behind and two wingers, probably in Mane and Oxley Chamberlain or Cater or Shakiri. There's just such a lot of options that I think Klopp may just tinker with it a little bit. So you've you've probably got four 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 two diamonds, you've probably got four two three one and you've probably got four four three. And I think that is a real beauty because if they do start changing those formations, if they do start looking at other options, teams aren't gonna have a clue <laughs> of what is coming at them. <laughs> Theo, you were talking before about Henderson playing in that six role and, and now being kind of liberated, the shackles taken off him back to where he was previously for Liverpool as a more advanced midfielder last season and and also, you know, that being allowed because of Fabinho's form. Do you think do you think him and, and his role and after he's had a full season under his belt, do you think that will have a, a bearing on the formations we'll see? Um, I think it's gonna be four three three just because it's Klopp's Liverpool. Mm. Um and Henderson now is in that role where he can really thrive in that formation. It might have a, a slight impact maybe on the fullbacks because the reason they were bursting forward so much is because there wasn't that pressure on the midfield. Now Henderson's an extra option there. Uh, but the only reason Liverpool went to four two three one last year is because the front three were feeling the strains after the World Cup. Um, yeah, they might feel the strain again after the Cup of Nations and the Copa America, but it's not the same pressure on them there. Um, and they'll just want to get back to club football. They've won a trophy, of course they want to get back to club football. Mm. But it's going to be a real big year for Jordan Henderson. Uh, like we saw before he was put in this number six position, um, what he could really do when he was going box to box. Uh, we've had a couple of seasons now where he's got one goal if he's lucky. Well, under Rodgers in those final days, he was one of Liverpool's best attacking threats. He was scoring yeah. goals from 25, 30 yards. And apart from Coutinho, Liverpool haven't really had players like that since Gerrard left, really. So um, there's that lot of pressure on there. And he's probably one of Liverpool's smartest players when it comes to um, picking those forward through balls. Uh, one of the best crosses on the team. He's going to be such a good attacking player there. And the fact that he can play it out to the full backs so they can get the crosses in or burst forward into the box. He's got a good leap on him as well. Um, the, what Liverpool have wanted to see from Gini Wijnaldum because of what he's gone and done on international duty, well, this is something you are going to be able to see from Jordan Henderson. And he's the captain, and now he can really thrive as the leader, showing it on the pitch, rather than having to say, um, right, my manager wants me to play here, I'm going to sac uh, sacrifice myself for the rest of my team. Mm. I think one of the things, like one of the overarching things you can take from this, and the fact that we're actually able to talk about formations, the fact that we're able to talk about these young players that you know are in and around the first team squad, and it's just the fact that Klopp's got everybody playing together so well, and it's evident in the first few games of pre-season. The first, obviously, he played a different team in in each half of each game, same team, and so on and so forth. But in both times, both teams looked like they just gelled so well that like the young players knew what they were doing. They knew how to play with older players. It just gives them such an opportunity to concentrate on their own games and improve. And yeah, it's just one of those things I think where. Liverpool are lucky and they've obviously done a lot of hard work in bringing in these players who are really intelligent footballers who are able to do such different things fill in in different positions be versatile use different formations and it's obviously a really really exciting time and a really exciting future mm -hmm. well in, in terms of exciting talk we'll, we'll finish on a final question which uh, looks, looks much more ahead this one was from uh, Lewis Clubley in our Blood Red Facebook group again um, well, he's actually said, how many of the six trophies on offer this season do you think Liverpool will re realistically end up winning? So he's either not counting the Club World Cup or that's already in the bag, so we'll, we'll ignore <laughs> that one. Qatar, we're, you know, we're, we're done with that one. So yeah, Community Shield, Super Cup, League Cup, Premier League, FA Cup and Champions League. 
at this stage, Connor, you first. Uh, how many of these do you think the Reds will, will, will bag this season? Do I dare say anything else? I'm in all six. <laughs> I'm six a dream. Is magic I'm a super positive dreamer. <laughs> all seven. <laughs> all seven? Yeah. Go for the magnificent all seven. seven. We'll be interested, won't we? Because, you know, they, they, for me, obviously, it was the unfortunate exits in the two domestic cups quite early on was largely down, I think, to the, to the draw. Couldn't have gone much worse. You know, Chelsea and then Wolves away was, was a real tricky one as well. Um, but Liverpool competed so well in those two big ones. I haven't, I haven't seen a Liverpool team do that, get right to the you know the the final, win one in, in two competitions like that for for years. So it does suggest that they could have a real crack at some of these cups. But what would what would be the pro- is it is I it all about the prem? Squad size is going to come down to how many fronts they're competing on, and I think Klopp yeah. decided last year pretty early on that he was going to make a beeline for the Premier League, didn't he? The Champions League, obviously, we played so, so well, and, and that was a, a massively fortuitous kind of circumstance. Alisson's massive save against Napoli, oh. like the final minutes of the Greek game, to send Liverpool through to the knockout stages. I think it was all about it was all about the Premier League, and I think it will be all about the Premier League again, I don't see why it shouldn't be. I think it's, you know, it's a trophy Klopp wants, it's a trophy Liverpool wants, it's a Liverpool fans want. Everybody our age, I have, I've never seen them win the league, and it's, mm. it's something I'm so desperate for. Um, I hope, I dream, I pray for as many trophies as possible. <laughs> um, I would love to see them go on and love another lovely run in the Champions League again because yeah. it's just such a size and we, and we love the Champions League. Liverpool have such an affinity with it. But for me, the Premier League is the big one. It's it's my... I think we said it to each other, didn't we? If Liverpool just... It's going to sound pretty so defeatist, but if Liverpool just win the League Cup next year, I'd be disappointed. Mm. Mm. Well, I think that's fair enough, isn't it? It's a measure of how far we've come. And Theo, is it, it he's the same? Is it all about that Premier League? Yeah, it's got to be like, um, I think, going through it, you're not bothered about the charity show, you're not bothered about um, this European It's a free cup. hit to try and get one over on City, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it's like that early mental blow on them. But realistically, I think Man City will win that just because they're used to playing in that game every season. Their squad, they've probably got that more experience coming into it. I expect Liverpool to win the European Super Cup just because Chelsea are a bit of a mess. Mm. Um, Club World Championships, it'd be nice if Liverpool could win it just because they've never won it before. But I think those that that competition particularly that will have a big impact on Liverpool's Champions League run. Like we saw last time in two thousand and five, two thousand and six, it's pretty much the only year under Rafa when he had a good Liverpool squad that the Champions League just ended up falling apart, losing to Benfica, and it will get to that stage where Liverpool will focus on the league. So that's what you want to win, isn't it? Like the Champions League last year, it was a nice like bonus compensation, whatever you want to call it. Mm. And now Liverpool have that first trophy. They'll have that belief that they can go and beat the best, that they can go and get their silverware. And if this year they don't win the league, there's going to be that mental block that they're always going to be the bridesmaid to Manchester City. They need to go out and they need to make that a top priority. Like if you can play so well last year and still miss out, if they can't win it this year, you're just going to think, well, when is your chance going to be? Mm. Right then, Lewis, so our answer is we'll either have six or seven, but realistically it's all about that one. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not the League Cup, it is the Premier League. So, uh, yes, we will be back in a, in a few days' time to assess uh, the first couple of Liverpool's games on the pre-season tour uh, in the US, as we've said. Lots of things to decide, but very, very exciting to see how things shake up, who emerges as the potential candidates to break through into that first team, and lots of things for Klopp to assess. So uh, we'll be back soon. Nice one.